morning. Good morning. Good morning. Friends, welcome on this Lord's Day. Welcome to the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to one and all of this time of fellowship and of Sabbath worship and rest. Welcome. Friends, brothers, and sisters, if you will, prepare your hearts and your minds to worship the living God as the choir calls us to worship. Open their eyes. 
eyes to see beyond our broken fellowship the wonders of your love displayed in Jesus of Nazareth and to follow where he calls them. We pray for the peace in the world, that you would disarm weapons and silence guns and put out ancient hate that smolders or flames in sudden conflict, to create goodwill among people of every race and nation. We pray for those who must go to war and for those who will not go. May they have conviction and charity toward one another. We pray for enemies, as Christ commanded, for those who oppose us or scheme against us, who are also children of your love. May we be kept from infectious hate or sick desire for vengeance. We pray for those involved in, in government who work for the reconciling of nations. Keep them hopeful and working for peace. We pray for those who govern us, who make, administer, or judge our laws. May this country ever be a, a land of free and able folk who welcome exiles and work toward your justice. We pray for poor people who are hungry or who are housed in cramped places. Increase in us and all who prosper concern for those who are disinherited. We pray for social outcasts for those excluded by their own militants or by the harshness of others. Give us grace to accept those that our world name is unacceptable and to show your mighty love. We pray for sick people who suffer pain or struggle with demons of the mind who silently cry out for healing. May they be patient, brave, and trusting. We pray for the dying who face final mystery May they enjoy light and life intensely and keep dignity and greet death unafraid, believing in your love. We pray for those whose tears are not yet dry, who listen for familiar voices and look for still familiar faces. In loss, may they affirm the gain that you promise in Jesus, who prepares a place for us within your spacious love. We pray for people who are alone and lonely, who have no one to call, and easy friendship. May they be remembered and befriended and know your care for them. We pray for families, for parents and children. May they enjoy each other, honor freedoms, and forgive as happily as we are all forgiven in your vast mercy. We pray for young and old, that you would give them patient youth, true vision, an experienced age, openness to new things. Let both praise your name. And we pray for all people everywhere. May they come into their own as sons and daughters of God and inherit the kingdom prepared in Jesus Christ, the Lord of all and the Savior of the world. And so we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, even us, to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, the, as we come to the almost the conclusion of the series on Revelation, uh, we find ourselves in Revelation chapter 20 this morning, the, the passage running from verses 1 through 6 of Revelation 20. So if you will, give ear to the scriptures, listen for what the Spirit might say to the church, listen to God's Word. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and locked and sealed it over him, so that he would deceive the nations no more, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be let out for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. 
I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Friends, may God bless the reading and hearing of this portion of God's holy word. Passage. 
passage today is the only one in Scripture that references that millennial thousand year period when Satan is bound and the saints reign with Christ. So the, the question that has vexed the church for lo these two thousand years is exactly what, what the text means. The millennial vision of Revelation 20 has inspired radical social movements and utopian experiments and revivals and, and communes from the earliest centuries of the church through the Middle Ages and down through today. The two common approaches to the millennium of Revelation 20 are the premillennial and the amillennial. Premillennialism has it that Christ will return pre, before, the millennium in order to establish it, ruling himself over a renewed earth of peace and plenty for a thousand years before ushering in eternity with a, with a final judgment. This view locates its rationale in Scripture, and it finds certainly scriptural justification, and it, it finds its recommenders uh, among the earliest of the church fathers. It's, it's a historical view of the church, premillennialism. The other common view is called the amillennial, ah negating millennium, meaning no millennium. It, it's an unfortunate kind of descriptor because amillennialism does not deny a millennium, a thousand year reign, only rather does it deny a physical earthly one. Amillennialism dates back to at least St. Augustine in the 5th century who came to see the fulfillment of Revelation 20 as pointing to a a spiritual, a heavenly reality. It's this understanding of Revelation 20 that you find, I think, in most uh, Catholic and mainline Protestant thinking. Uh, in looking at the text and allowing Scripture to, to interpret Scripture as it relates to this passage, it seems reasonable to me to find in the millennial reign a reference to the spiritual state as an indeterminate length of time between the first and the second coming of Christ. The 1,000 year millennium represents the reign of the risen Christ, I think, between his first and second comings. If you remember Psalm 50 verse 10 finds the psalmist exulting that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It doesn't mean that God doesn't own the cattle on hill number 1001. Rather, God owns everything. It's about vastness, the number. Or in Isaiah 60, verse 22, we read, The least of you will become a thousand, the smallest of mighty nation. I am the Lord, and it's time I will do swiftly. In Scripture, seven denotes perfection or fullness. Ten functions to denote quantity, vastness. Uh, one commentator said, manyness. So 1,000 in Scripture is kind of 10 tripled over on itself, 10 by 10 by 10. You, you can't get any more fullness uh, than 1,000. It is about vastness upon vastness. In this instance, it means a really long time. So in this vast period of time in Revelation 20, what happens? And the Scripture would tell us a few things. The passage says that Satan is bound for 1,000 years. Satan is bound for a thousand years so as not to deceive the nation. In this time period, bad things still happen, evil still exists. But it says that the nations, the ethnois, the, the peoples of the world, the Gentiles, are free in some sense to hear the gospel, to respond to God. They are not bound or deceived or blinded by Satan, the devil. Before the first coming of Christ, the scriptures tell us, the nations were deceived. Acts 26 reads, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you to open their eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The first chapter of John's Gospel says that Christ is that light which comes into the world, enlightening every person. The, the stronghold, the darkness of Satan is broken 
by the first coming of Christ. And so people are able to respond to God's love in Him. After Jesus sent out the 72 on a mission in Luke's Gospel, they returned, and we read this. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subjected to us in your name. And he, Jesus, said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. After the arrival of Jesus, the nations, the peoples of the world are liberated from Satan's dominion. I think is what the New Testament is telling us. Evil cannot stop the advance of the gospel's message of forgiveness and love among the world's peoples. What Revelation 20 also says is that at the end of this long, vast period of time between the first and second coming of Christ, at the very conclusion, Satan is loosed and there is a last rebellion of the nations of the peoples of the world before the final consummation and the victory of the good. But for now, the gospel goes out to all the world and the nations are tempered by its message of forgiveness and mercy and love. The world was changed by the first coming of Christ and the good news of God's love has and continues to change lives among all the peoples of the world. That's, that's one part, one lesson I think that Revelation is teaching us. But what else is occurring during this thousand year millennium? It says the saints who would not worship the, the beast of Revelation, evil writ large, come to life and reign with Christ for those thousand years. This coming to life and reigning is described in the text as the first resurrection. As to, as to the idea of the first resurrection in verse 6, if you recall back in the book of Genesis, at the very beginning of the Bible story, God warns Adam and Eve that if they disobey His command and they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that in that day they will surely die. The scriptures indicate that, that that death was twofold. They didn't physically die on that day, but they spiritually died, and ultimately they would come to physically die. Our first parents in that sin were alienated from God, cut off from God. Their communion with God ruptured by sin. They spiritually died. And working from that description of the human condition, Paul writes about coming to faith in Ephesians as being taken from death to life as a kind of resurrection. Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you walked, in Ephesians chapter 2, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we, we may do well to consider that the first resurrection of Revelation 20 represents the saving faith of the, of the believer, moving from spiritual death to being made spiritually alive in Christ, a kind of resurrection. As one is taken from spiritual death to spiritual life, the one trusting in Jesus is said to reign with Him. That reigning extends to heaven and anticipates a day of final resurrection when soul and a, a renewed, glorified, resurrected body are reunited in a new heaven and a new earth. The final or the second resurrection then comes at the conclusion of the millennium, of that time between the first and second comings of Christ. And as an aside, the Old, the old and New Testaments point us toward the idea that a, a human is only a human being as an embodied being, as a soul and a body united. That's the point of Christ's physical resurrection. Because death could not defeat Christ, it will not be the end for those who are united with Him in faith. 
The unity of the body and the soul is a fundamental belief in Christian Orthodoxy, Protestant or Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. Well, looking at our passage today, having said all that, we ask, as always, the question, so what? What does the passage mean? Paul writes in 2 Timothy, If we endure, we shall also reign with him. This passage is like a great deal of revelation between the, the woes and the trumpets and the disasters. This is a, a passage of comfort and hope and assurance. We are assured in today's passage of Christ's victory over evil. If in the tumble of revelations, vivid and symbolic descriptions of the contest between good and evil in the world and in our own hearts, we have been reminded of the reality of the tragedy of sin and its effects and of God's judgment on sin, we are also reminded that this war has already been won. The battle spot in this life are the outworking of God's accomplished victory in the cross and the empty tomb of Christ. Your circumstances can be dire, life can throw a lot at you, but if you have been taken from death to life in Christ, you are reigning with him now already as a son and daughter of God. Death cannot erase your standing in Christ. Death becomes a coronation. Because of Christ, it has lost its sting. William Miller, in 1844, was a sincere, if, if misguided, believer, I think. He provides us a cautionary tale. We do well to avoid date-setting and speculation about the coming again of Christ or, or other apocalyptic prognostications that go beyond Scripture. Rather, I think we can allow the, the, sweep, the grand sweep of Revelation 20 to communicate to each of us its message of hope. Sin and death have no hold over us in the end. Because Christ, because of Christ crucified and risen, you and I are alike held in the care and the keeping of God in death and in life alike now and forever. Revelation 20 verses 1 through 6 is a message of hope and comfort. We belong to God in Christ. Amen. And so friends, as a response to that scripture and to John's words to us, if you're able to stand in body or spirit, we'll stand as we sing together. Hymn number 496, Leaning on the Everlasting Heart.
friends, brothers, and sisters, as we conclude our worship here to go out and worship God in the world, here and receive this benediction from Scripture. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. And help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord now and forevermore and evermore. Alleluia.